Hello everyone, Mr. Waz here and welcome to another episode of Wazly Science. In this episode, we are going to be talking about water management. We're going to talk about direct and non-direct pollution and then we are going to get into mercury, nitrates, nitrites, phosphates, DDT, and much, much more. So let's get started. So let's start by talking about the word pollution. It's a word that's used very loosely. I'd like you right now to write down your own definition of pollution, and then we're gonna go back and see what you wrote. So please make sure you write your own definition at this time. And what I have on the right here is a TV show called Captain Planet that existed in the 90s. When I was a kid, I would watch this show, and I really liked it as a kid. I watch it now, and I realize how much garbage it was. But in the top right, I mean the bottom right, you could watch the very first episode, which is pretty hilarious. It shows how the Planeteers get their powers to fight against all the bad guys in the world that pollute. So, yeah, um, you may know this show, you may not. It, it existed, though. <laughs> all right, so here's my definition of pollution. It's an introduction of contaminants into the natural environment that causes instability, disorder, harm, or discomfort to the ecosystem. And there are actually many kinds of pollutions that we can talk about here. The one in this video is on water pollution, which is on the bottom right. On the top left is air pollution, which we talked about in the last unit when we talked about NOx and SOx and carbon monoxide, etc. But there are other types of pollution that I'd like you to be familiar with. The first one um, here we have light pollution, which is when there's so many lights on in cities and stuff and it brightens the sky so much at night that you can't even see stars. And this can cause um, dis disorder in the ecosystem like with nocturnal animals. Littering is a type of pollution, of course. We're going to talk about littering more in the next unit when we do land pollution. Noise pollution is actually a big one. Um, not only are there noises on land, which could disrupt the ecosystem and disturb animals, but in the water, too. There's some buoys that will give off pings and that will really frustrate whales and screw around with their migration patterns. Soil contamination is... of is a self-explanatory. That's when the soil becomes contaminated and able to, unable to grow food. Um, radioactive contamination can come from nuclear waste, um, uranium in, that is unstable. Um, thermal pollution is an interesting one. Nuclear power plants release very hot water into rivers and that can change the temperature of the river and cause a sort of imbalance in the natural seasoning of a river so maybe it doesn't melt as properly and and fish don't hibernate and cause them to hunt which could imbalance the system visual pollution is another one that surprises kids but visual pollution is a pretty big deal you know how we have uh, bull, uh, billboards on the sides of our highways well some states find that to be visual pollution and they restrict it like in Colorado there are no billboards allowed um, and sewage is when we have um, feces and crud going into our water systems and then water pollution. So yeah, there are many different kinds of, what, of pollution that we're going to be talking about this year. Now, in West Hartford, Connecticut, you have access to water whenever you want it and pretty much as much as you want. But it is a major global problem. It's the leading world, worldwide cause of deaths. Um, 14,000 people die each day from some sort of water pollution. Seven, 700 million people in India don't even have access to a proper toilet. Um, 500 million people lack access to safe water, so drinkable water. That's around 7% of the world's population. That's, you know, that's around equal to unemployment that we have in the United States. You know, not having a job is one thing, but imagine not having water. And it, it's it's very disturbing. Like how could we how could we let this happen? How could we all not have access to water? Uh, we're gonna be watching a video in class called uh, Blue Gold, and it really gives us an insight to this major water crisis that we have. 
There are two types of pollution, point source pollution and non-point source pollution. Point source pollution is brought into the environment from a direct traceable source. In other words, you can point to the pipe and say, hey, look, there's pollution coming out of that pipe. There is contamination. There is some type of metal that can contaminate the environment. There it is coming out of the pipe. Factory discharge is a great example. Storm drains, gas stations, under which have um, USTs, which are underground storage tanks. These are all point source pollution. They're very easy, be, easy to solve because you can go right to where they are coming from and stop it. Now, non-point source pollution is a different story. It doesn't it doesn't originate from a single source. So it's a small amount of contaminants that gather in a large area. Examples are, you know, when there's a storm and there are rubber and fluids washed up, you don't really know where they came from. Excess fertilizers from fields, when you have a lot of different farms all together, you don't know who is using too much fertilizer, so you can't really blame one farm over another farm. And that becomes a really big problem because you have you don't have anyone to blame, therefore somebody's got to fix it, whether it's the EPA or you know other types of companies but you really it's really hard to get money to pay for those things because you have no one to blame in this video we are going to discuss a couple different types of pollution uh, such as mercury uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the story of DDT and then at the end we're going to focus on nitrates and phosphates mercury is a very interesting element because it's one of the few that are a liquid at room temperature and it also has a density of 13.6 which is crazy like water has a density of one so it's 13.6 times more dense than water even gold has a density of like 19 it's almost as dense as solid gold here okay that's crazy there's a mug this picture here has has a mug full of mercury and there's a pool ball sitting on top of it so the liquid is so dense it could balance things that are heavy on top of it even though it's a liquid we used to use it in tons of different stuff we put it everywhere just like we put lead everywhere we were really smart back in the day here that's sarcasm by the way um, it was used in thermometers barometers vapor lamps batteries even in the preparation of chemical pesticides remember people pesticides go on food yeah so it's highly toxic it's both found naturally and also it, it can be introduced into the environment naturally. Um, here's how it's found naturally. It can be found from volcanoes and geological deposits, which is like just found in different rocks. Um, some rocks and soil and sediments can even contain small traces of mercury. So yes, it's, it's found in nature, usually kept away safely. Um, introduced by humans is a different story. Sometimes mercury is introduced um, into the atmosphere when we burn coal because there's some traces of mercury in coal so it can get released into the atmosphere from coal po fired power plants when we incinerate or burn medical waste like old thermometers if we just throw an old thermometer into the trash it'll event eventually find its way into an incinerator and then get burned and then put into the air when we mine gold we actually will use mercury to to help separate the gold it dissolves easily so mercury is used when we're mining gold and then there's the incandescent light bulbs which are the ones we use in the light bulb fundraiser they actually have about the amount of merc each bulb has the amount of mercury in them equal to the tip of a pen so that's a very very small amount but let's say you decide to throw away a lot of light bulbs all at once you're actually putting mercury into the environment so it's very important with those incandescent light bulbs that you properly recycle them you can bring them to home depot best buy etc and then some industrial processes so in other words like factories productions things that make stuff can release mercury into the environment and it can get into the water which is what we're talking about here there are two videos here that you can watch one is about how to properly recycle old thermometers and the other one on the bottom here talks about the mercury pollution from incandescent light uh, incandescent light bulbs so that's pretty interesting take a look at those mercury 
has major health effects. It can totally mess you up. It has neurological problems, so it can make you have difficulty walking. It can give you tremors. It can cause discoloration in your eyes. It can irritate your skin. And then it can damage your muscles and your nervous system. It has chronic exposure, can lead to even emotional problems. In other words, guys, it can make you go crazy. So hat makers in the 1800s, they would use mercury to clean out um, when they would take pelts, like a beaver pelt, for example, to make their hats. They would use different furs to make the hats, like from different forest woodland creatures and they would skin them and then take their fur and when they would do that they would use mercury so their hands would be in mercury baths with these furs and you know they would scratch their head and so this mercury eventually go all over their body and it would make them have major emotional problems and that is where the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland comes from. So they think that the Mad Hatter was mad because he worked with Mercury. That's right. You learned something today. You're welcome. So yeah, after that, you probably won't play around with Mercury. Here's the thing, though. When Mercury enters the environment, the microbes may change into methyl mercury, And Mercury can move up the food chain, guys. That's what we're worried about here. So when it becomes methylmercury, that can be easily absorbed into the tissues of aquatic organisms, and it's very hard to eliminate. And it cannot be broken down in the body of the microbes, so it just stays there. So what ends up happening is that things like zooplankton, phytoplankton, the methylmercury will literally stick to it, and little tiny fish eat lots of pl of plankton every single day and which means they're in lots of methylmercury every single day and then bigger fish eat lots of little fish every single day who have eaten lots of plankton that have all absorbed methylmercury so as you move up more and more on the food chain you are seeing a significant amount of methylmercury that is in the bodies of these organisms and what ends up happening is that you get a term called bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulation is the idea that um, something like mercury moves up the food chain in a sense that if you eat animals that are higher on the food chain, you are absorbing most of the methylmercury. It will stay within the tissues of an organism, and that animal gains a contaminant along with all the other contaminants that the other microbes it ate. The higher the animal is on the food chain, the more contaminant that it could contain. And this bioaccumulation leads to biomagnification. So that's when the pollutants increase in quantity in the organisms higher in the food chain. So like if one human eats 10 large fish, one small one large fish eats 10 small fish and one small fish eats 10 zooplankton and one zooplankton eats 10 phytoplankton and each plankton has a pollutant that just stuck to it that means that the human has 10,000 times more methylmercury than anything than the phytoplankton so that's that's the real big problem here that's why you could get mer mercury poisoning if you ate a lot of sushi because sushi has tuna or salmon and both of those fish are high on the food chain. They're considered a large fish. So by you eating fish often, you could be exposed to mercury poisoning. All right, we've had enough of mercury. Let's move on to some other things. We're going to start talking about nitrates now. So nitrogen, as you know from the last unit, is 78% of our atmosphere, it's it's stuff that we breathe. Now NO2 is part of NOx, but we're gonna talk about it in a different sense here. That's nitrite, and then NO3 is nitrate. And these are actually ingredients that are used in farm fertilizers. They're used in farm fertilizers because they, they are a nutrient, and they are one of the four needed things that a plant needs in order to grow. They need nutrients, and then the other three are water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight. They, they help amplify the growth of the plant. 
or food, the crops. Um, they are also used in red meats to preserve them. And the excess nitrates can enter streams, rivers, and lakes, and eventually the ocean. What I mean by that is not all of the fertilizer that a farm uses gets used by the plants that they are growing. So it ends up just going through the soil, seeping through the soil, and eventually finding its way to any sort of local stream or river. And when it does that, the phytoplankton get a hold of the nitrates. They're plants too, and they love nutrients. It makes them really happy, and they get to multiply. And when they multiply, they can multiply uncontrollably and make something called an algae bloom or an algae bloom. And that's when you have a super high amount of phytoplankton. That's not a good thing. And what happens is the pond becomes very scummy and green. There's way too much phytoplankton. And when you have an overpopulation of something, you have a, a crash. So eventually, there's no more nutrients left or carbon dioxide left to support the high, the high demand of, of, of phytoplankton. And what happens is you have a massive die-off. All the plankton die at once. And this leads to eutrophification. That word is underlined for a reason, people. Make sure you have that. And if this part was confusing, I highly recommend you w listen to it again. Phosphates are a lot like nitrates. Same, type, same song and dance here. They're used in fertilizer. They stimulate the growth of plankton and water and plants too. They're also used in detergents and toothpaste and meats and cheese. So they're used in fertilizer and many other things as well. Now, problem with phosphates is that when you have too much, just like with nitrates, the algae and the water and the weeds grow out of control. And the scum can develop on the surface and then die from a lack of nutrients and CO2. All the phosphates and nitrates, I mean, all the, they all get used up, and then all the plankton die, they sink to the bottom, and decomposition starts to occur. Decomposition requires oxygen, as we learned from the carbon cycle unit. Now, when you have a massive amount of things dying, all the oxygen gets sucked up quickly, and eventually there's no more oxygen left in the bottom of this pond. And here's what's even worse. The things that make the oxygen just died. Yeah, the, plank the phytoplankton are the ones that contribute the oxygen to the water, but they're dead. So there's no oxygen to replenish in order for decomposition to even occur. And animals that live mainly on the bottom of the pond, they need oxygen too. Shellfish, trout, worms, they all start to die and eutrophication starts to occur. This is also known as hypoxia, both the same thing. Their die-off requires more decomposition because now they're dead too, but there's no oxygen to help the bacteria decompose the animals. So the water becomes polluted literally with dead things that can't even decompose. It's a very, very messy situation. And this is more common than you think. And it all stems from too many nutrients in some sort of pond lake. These two pie charts show us the sources of the nutrients that are delivered to the Gulf of Mexico. So that's that's the bottom there, the Mississippi River, you know, near Louisiana, Florida. So you can see that through through um, where our phosphates, a lot of it is coming from growing animals to eat. Uh, so cows, pigs, things like that. And then also, you know, grown corn, because we use corn syrup and it's found in all the, you know, cheap crud that Americans eat. And then you got the other crops too. Now, if you look at the nitrogen, which are from the nitrates, half of it is from our corn and soybean crops. And not nearly as much is used on the pasture and range. So this is pretty interesting because you can see where the sources of our nitrogen and phosphorus comes from, from these two pie charts. I, I recommend that you have them. Okay, here are some health effects to have in too many nitrates or phosphates in our water supply. Babies can experience a shortness of breath and become very ill. They can cause something called brown blood disease in fish, which affects fish and can kill them. It also interacts with humans' hemoglobin, 
which is our bloodstream and destroys the ability of blood cells to transport oxygen, that's really bad. That's the point of blood. Blood transports oxygen through our body. And scientists are finding that nitrites and nitrites in red meats are carcinogens, which are often found in hot dogs to preserve the life of hot dogs for a long time. So in other words, that too many hot dogs they're finding could give you cancer. Uh, phosphates in our water supply. So algae blooms can lead to toxins in the water, and this can make the water undrinkable. So toxins can get released if there is an algae bloom, and it makes you incapable of drinking the water. All right, I'm going to be brief with DDT because we're going to be doing a whole lesson on it in class. But anyway, DDT is a very strong pesticide that was used after World War II. Um, a pesticide is something that you spray on your crops in a farm to prevent insects from consuming your crops. It worked very well on destroying the insects. It was used everywhere in the United States. And then a biologist named Rachel Carlson wrote a book called Silent Spring. It was a very big turning point um, in history, in American history, and even the world. It really started the idea of actually caring about the environment. It explained how DDT is disrupting the balance of nature. Specifically, she says how birds who eat the insects that have been sprayed with DDT will die off, and that the spring season will no longer have seen in birds, hence the name of the book, Silent Spring. It's really started the environmental movement in the 50s, and then DDT was in the 50s and late 60s, I mean, and DDT was eventually banned on a worldwide scale. In other words, no one in the world can use it. And some scientists believe that her claim had no science and DDT could help areas that are battling malaria. So that's kind of a brief introduction on things with DDT. We're going to be talking much more about DDT in class. It's very interesting. On this slide here, you could watch these two videos. They were going to give you a general idea about DDT. We are going to be watching these in class most likely, but if you need to review for them, here they are. Um, you watch these to help develop a background and history on DDT. And then we're going to be watching more videos in class. At this point, you're probably pretty concerned about your water, and you should be. But there is some hope here. First off, let's talk about the regulations. In 1974, long before you were born, Congress passed the Safe Drinking Water Act standards. And this allowed uh, only certain amounts of things that could be in the water that would be safe for us. And they looked at each of the contaminants and, and, and sort of did surveys on how much of each contaminant is okay to be in the water, like lead and mercury and all these other things. Um, there also was the Emergency Planning and Committee Rights Act, which this required industries to give an annual report on the amount of toxins that they release. And then this information is available to the public from the EPA. So you can see how much an industry is releasing and what they're releasing. So if you don't like what they're releasing, you can fight that and tell them to not do it. So that's pretty cool. It gives more power to the people. In terms of technology, we have a couple things here that really clean up the water. First off, a water treatment plant. You may have heard of one of these. Water treatment plants are great. They clean dirty water and make it drinkable again. There is a video on the right here that you could watch to learn about water treatment plants. Some of you have actually gone on field trips to see them. It's a very fascinating place. So then there's a piece of technology called reverse osmosis. And what this does is it uses pressure to clean the water by running the water through the sediment and carbon filters. And I'll put a link on the bottom that can give you more information on reverse osmosis. Very interesting. Another thing we have are desalinization plants. These are really popular actually in Saudi Arabia. And what they do is they convert salt water into fresh water which that's a big deal because as we've learned 98% of our water is oceanic water and that 2% that's fresh water well most of it is in glaciers so yeah that's really cool we also have low flush toilets sinks that don't use as much water shower heads that don't release as much water and then in terms of farming they will use something called trickle irrigation systems and they this is a irrigation system lined with ditches so what it does is 
it, it sprays the water directly to the plants rather than just all over the entire field. And we also can simply just replace toxic chemicals that we use, like pesticides, with non-toxic chemicals. And then that way the toxins don't get into the water. Here's a picture of reverse osmosis and how it works. I actually use them myself when I am preparing for saltwater aquariums. And here is a diagram of a large desalinization plant. I believe this is the one that they are designing or already have designed, designed in Saudi Arabia. Over here on the top left, we can see a example of a trickle irrigation system. So you can see what I'm talking about here. So that the hoses are lined directly with the plants. So they're getting the water, not just all of the dirt, and they're able to absorb the water and thus grow. And then we can see here the difference of models of toilets that have been that have been changed. And so if you replace a, a toilet that is pre-1980 that uses seven gallons of water per flush, you'll save 5.4 gallons per flush. So that's pretty cool. And last we have for what the individual can can do. First off, don't litter. Be conscientious and clean up even if it isn't yours. Because the thing about littering is that if you drop something and it goes down a sewer drain or something, it's going to find its way to Long Island Sound, which is everybody's estuary that is connected with Connecticut. We don't want to do that. So when you litter, it does end up somewhere else, and it can end up in water and make things even worse. Be careful of tractors and other equipment because things like tractors actually use a lot of gasoline. Um, wash your car on a lawn rather than in the dirt because the, the chemicals that you're using to wash the car can then find them way into sewage. Using less fertilizer is a big deal because when you have excess fertilizer, those nitrates and phosphates find themselves into a water stream and then create algae blooms. One thing that I really like that I think more houses need to do is do something called planting a rain garden. And rain gardens are really cool because they reduce the amount of runoff from your house and will collect the excess nutrients and prevent them from entering the water. So basically they stop the nutrients from going down into the sewer. It's basically just a garden that you have lower in your yard so that all the nutrients with water will go down to the garden and the garden itself will absorb the nutrients before it enters a sewer or something else. Using less water, that's an easy one, right? And don't pour things like bleach and oil down the drain. Those things can really kill the microbes that are used in the water treatment plants. Here's an example right here of a rain garden. So what you can see going on here is this oil from the car is finding its way into the sewer, then going straight to something like Long Island Sound. But with a rain garden, you know, oils and, and chemicals can go into the garden and actually plants will absorb those nutrients and actually use them and grow. And some plants do a better job at this than others. So if you look to the right over here, you can see examples of rain gardens. So you can see how the grass is elevated in a certain way that all the water is going to go to the garden and the garden's going to absorb the nutrients and prevent them from going into your sewer. So really cool thing there. They're great. I, I, I really feel that every house should have one. Alrighty guys, we did it. We got through water management. Hooray! Okay, so I got four videos for you, although two of them we should be watching in class. The one on the top left, we may not get to class. It's phosphates and nitrates, nutrient pollution by the EPA. The one on the top right, we should be able to do in class, although it doesn't hurt to watch it again. It's called After the Storm by the Weather Channel. The bottom left, we are going to be watching in class. That is called Blue Gold and is a documentary. And on the bottom right, I highly recommend you watch this video. It is on mercury pollution. All right, guys, thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe and take care.